Hey there, Sports History fan. Arnie Chapman here from the Sports History Network. Now, before you jump into this episode, I wanted to share with you an exciting giveaway we have going on with Home Field Apparel. We have a digital $50 gift card to homefieldapparel.com for one lucky fan of the Sports History Network. All you got to do is head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash giveaways to sign up. Again, that's sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash giveaways. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Now, live and direct from the press box at Old Comiskey Park, it's time for when football was football. Let's join your host, Joe Ziemba, with another forgotten tale from Chicago's pro football history. Let's go! Welcome to this episode of When Football Was Football on the Sports History Network. I'm your host, Joe Ziemba. Let's set the stage. It was a warm November afternoon on the Chicago lakefront, but over 120,000 people were crammed into Soldier Field for the big football game. 120,000. Were the Bears playing? Nope. Or perhaps the Chicago Cardinals? Nah. Maybe Notre Dame? Nope. None of the big boys from the area were on the field, but instead it was just a couple of local high school teams. What type of game could attract such a huge audience to witness a bunch of kids playing football? On this episode of When Football Was Football, we'll take a break from covering professional football and journey back to 1937 for a celebration of one of Chicago's most prominent annual sporting events, the Prep Bowl. Each year, the high school season in the city would conclude with the enormously popular clash between the champions of the Chicago Catholic League and the Chicago Public League. Things have changed over the years, of course, but for decades, the Prep Bowl easily garnered one of the largest attendances of any sporting competition in the United States. It all began informally and inconspicuously in 1927 when Mount Carmel of the Chicago Catholic League eased past Schur's 6-0 for city bragging rights before 50,000 attendees. DePaul Academy fell to Tilden 12-0 in 1928, but then no game was played until after the uh, 1933 season except for Mount Carmel's 44-6 loss to Harrison in 1931. In 1934, under the guidance of Chicago Mayor Edward Kelly, the game itself was formally established as an annual event, pitting the champions of the two leagues against each other. Known then as the Mayor's Charity Game, the contest served not only as an attractive sporting event, but also provided an opportunity to generate revenue for charitable organizations in the Chicago area. Since the city of Chicago was basically sponsoring the game, Ticket prices were very low, let's say 50 cents to a dollar, and city employees such as firemen were encouraged to hawk the tickets with the understanding that it was perfectly acceptable to purchase a ticket even if there was no intention of attending the game. This fundraising aspect of the game was clearly important. But in 1937, there was an added interest with the magical presence of halfback Bill D. Coravant in the backfield of Austin High School the public league champions. The 5'10", 180-pound senior was perhaps the most celebrated high school athlete in the country at the time. The elusive runner scored an unbelievable 39 touchdowns that season, and wire services around the country eagerly shared his exploits on the gridiron. Among DeCorvant's significant accomplishments was the total of 57 points he scored in an early season 93-0 romp over McKinley High School. In that blowout, DeCorvant carried only 10 times, but scored on 9 of those attempts. With the addition of his 3 extra point kicks, DeCorvant accumulated an amazing 57 points on the day. The 1938 Austin Yearbook fondly reported on that historic McKinley game, saying, In the last quarter alone, the team scored 54 points for another record. Victory was all the more remarkable in that the first team played only two quarters of the game. Austin High School was undefeated with an 8-0 record heading into the championship battle with the Catholic League's Leo High School on November 27, 1937. 
Aside from its 93-point destruction of McKinley High School, Austin demonstrated its offensive firepower in romps over Farragut, 47-0, Marshall, 61-6, and Steinmetz, 32-0. Austin then reached the overall city championship game by defeating Sen High School, 14-6, in the public league title tilt. Although the Sen victory represented the closest winning margin of the year for Austin, it was also the second straight public league championship for the school. On the other, or Catholic side of the field, Leo High School was also 8-0 if one forgets a season opening 7-6 practice game loss to Loyola Academy. Leo possessed its own backfield star and left halfback John Gavin, the leading scorer in the Catholic League who was also named to the All-Catholic and All-City Honor Squads at the end of the 1937 season. Coached by Eloysius L. Whitey Cronin, Leo previously found its way to the city title game in 1934 and 1935, losing both games to Lindblom by identical 6-0 scores. In 1937, Leo captured its fourth straight South Section crown in the Catholic League by beating De La Salle 22-6 on November 7th, then needed to patiently wait for the North Section race to sort itself out. Eventually, St. George emerged as the North contender, and in the battle for Catholic League supremacy, Leo prevailed with a tough 6-0 victory. This qualified Leo to meet Austin in the city championship battle. All of this prompted the Chicago Tribune to happily preview the city title game. It said, Johnny Gavin and Leo versus Willie D. Corvant in Austin. That will be the scenario next Saturday at Soldier Field when the champions of the city and Catholic leagues meet in the annual interleague battle for Chicago's own Christmas benefit, sponsored by Mayor Kelly. So the stage was set for an engaging match between the two most powerful and undefeated prep clubs in the city. And in those days before television and the internet, just about everybody in Chicago was anxious to personally witness this highly anticipated game. There was no lack of coverage in the numerous local newspapers, where the tremendous accomplishments of De Corvant were recounted almost daily. The importance of the outcome was equally important to both the public and parochial followers of the game of football in Chicago. Still, football wasn't all that big of a deal to De Corvant, as he noted years later, saying, It's funny that now, and this was 1987, Football seems to be getting more and more important to people with each passing day. It didn't seem so important to me at the time. In 1937, Soldier Field in Chicago looked much different than it does today. Although it included seating for approximately 72,000, additional seating or standing room could be accommodated on the sloping, open north end of the field itself. And that is where thousands found themselves on game day. In addition, hundreds more could observe the action by standing on the track surrounding the football field itself. According to local newspapers, the gates to Soldier Field were opened on November 27th, nearly two hours before the 1.30 p.m. kickoff time. The lines outside the gates were long for those waiting to enter. But as fans continued pouring in, it was clear that the ambitious ticket sellers sent out by Mayor Kelly had done their job very, very well except that the thousands of expected no-shows did indeed intend to be present for the game on this warm late autumn day. With the temperature hovering above the 50 degree mark, it was a near perfect afternoon for football. As a 1,000 member student band composed of musicians from the city schools initiated the festivities with a resounding rendition of the Star Spangled Banner at 1 p.m., the march of attendees into the stadium was relentless. By 1.30, Soldier Field was filled with additional attendees squeezed into aisles while others stood seven deep all around the top of the U-shaped structure. While no official attendance was recorded, Evan Kelly of the Chicago Park District indicated that the crowd was even bigger than the 112,000 who witnessed the 1926 Army-Navy game at Soldier Field. With estimates running as high as 125,000 and as low as 110,000, the Chicago Tribune announced that the Park District guessed that the likely number was 120,000. 30 years later, Bill Hyland, the Austin High School coach, recalled the presence of the huge crowd at Soldier Field in an interview with the Chicago Tribune. He said, 
The big thing was that crowd, 120,000 people. People were sitting all the way up the slope. And then there were thousands of them on the track which circled the football field. I didn't really notice the crowd until it was all over and then when I saw them, it was quite a thrill. And then in 1987, years after the game, De Corvant himself remembered the impressive audience in an interview with the Associated Press by saying, I remember going back for a punt and seeing people standing all along the edge of the bowl, two or three deep on the ledges, kind of outlined by the sky. He then added in a separate comment to the Chicago Tribune, I couldn't imagine there would be this many people coming to see a high school football game. All I could say to myself was, don't louse things up now. De Corvan failed to louse things up. In fact, his performance was superlative. Even the Los Angeles Times reported on this game, stating, The game served as justification for 19-year-old De Corvan's yards of press notices. And then the South Bend Tribune added, Most of the crowd, the largest ever to see a high school game, had turned out to see a high-scoring De Corvan. He rewarded them. Austin rambled to an easy 26-0 victory over Leo High School behind the spectacular performance of De Corvant, as reported by the Tribune. Bill De Corvant, one of the most widely publicized prep stars in history, was suffering from a charley horse yesterday and was made nervous by a record crowd announced at 120,000. So all the blonde star from Austin did was score three touchdowns and pass into the end zone for the fourth one. These deeds were the climaxes of the many sterling maneuvers that enabled Austin's Maroons to whip Leo's Lions 26-0 in a grand game which enriched Chicago's own Christmas benefit fund by $110,000. After a scoreless first quarter, DeCorvant broke the scoring drought by dancing away for a 47-yard touchdown run behind the blocking of talented tackle John Starkey. After the extra point by Alf Bauman, Austin led 7-0. Shortly thereafter, an intercepted pass by Austin resulted in a second TB by De Corvant, this time on a one-yard plunge. Once again, Bauman booted the extra try and Austin extended its advantage to 14-0 at the halfway mark. Austin struck again in the third stands and when De Corvant raced in from the three to move his team ahead 20-0. The final blow occurred in the fourth quarter when DeCormand tossed a 25-yard scoring pass to Sonny Score, resulting in a 26-0 victory for Austin. DeCormand picked up an even 100 yards on 16 carries for the day and also intercepted a pass deep in his own territory that thwarted a long Leo offensive drive. Writer Edward Burns of the Tribune argued that the real story was not just the overwhelming attendance, but the quality of play on the field by the two squads. And he said, Whether the crowd was 90,000 or 130,000, the customers were all entertained, not only by Austin's brilliant performance, but by the dogged fight of the Leo boys, who kept right on trying after their dreams of victory had been rudely jolted in the second quarter. While disappointed in another failure to capture the city title in 1937, the Leo Club was honored in the school's yearbook, which stated, The Austin squad had too much power in one Bill de Corvant, a combination that was too much for the Lions. Although outweighed and severely bruised, every Leo man that entered the game fought with everything he had until the final whistle sounded. The Lions, however, would bounce back with city championship game wins in 1941 and 1942, both over Tilden. The 1941 contest drew a crowd of 95,000 people and Leo was named as the mythical high school national champion for that season. But for Austin, the schedule was not yet concluded. The school accepted a challenge from Jackson High School in Tennessee to battle for the national high school supremacy. In front of 5,000 fans at Crump Stadium in Memphis on December 11, 1937, Austin battled the freezing elements to defeat Jackson 13-0 to complete an undefeated 10-0 campaign. DeCorvant scored the first touchdown for Austin on a 37-yard run, but then injured his shoulder in the second period and played sparingly after that. But it was a joyful end to the year as noted by the Austin yearbook. 
It said, two weeks later, after the Leo game, the Maroons migrated southward to wind up a glorious season and annex the mythical national championship, defeating the South's title holders from Jackson, Tennessee, 13-0. So this is kind of funny, but how did the pros in 1937 compare attendance-wise with the high school juggernaut known as Austin High School? Well, after the Austin game brought over 120,000 to Soldier Field on November 27, 1937, the Chicago Bears drew just 4,188 for their game a day later at Wrigley Field. For Bill DeCorvant, his football career was just beginning. His collegiate recruitment was intense, with Collier's Eye reporting that DeCorvant was sought by virtually every big-time institution in the land and reputedly offered as high as $2,000 per season by several Pacific Coast schools. DeCorvant would be assured of a lucrative job in Warner Brothers Movie Studio, plus $250 per game to enroll at Troy, which was the University of Southern California. Instead, DeCorvant decided to stay at home and enrolled at Northwestern University in North Suburban Evanston, where he enjoyed a productive career. One of his better games was when he scored two touchdowns in a 51-3 win over Kansas State in 1941, and he partnered with future Pro Football Hall of Famer Otto Graham in the Northwestern backfield. Although he was drafted by the Washington Redskins of the National Football League in 1942, DeCorvon elected to serve in the military during World War II. Upon his discharge, he played five seasons in the National Football League for Washington and Detroit, as well as both the Chicago Cardinals and the Chicago Bears. Then in 1987, the Austin High School team gathered for a 50th anniversary celebration of that magnificent battle with Leo, and DeCorvant reflected on the importance of the game to himself. He said, People always want to talk about that game, how important it was to them. I just wanted to be a good athlete ever since I could breathe. I guess you could say that game was the fulfillment of a dream. By 1949, the Public League had established dominance in the series by winning 10, dropping 4, and tying two games. The 1949 contest featured Schurz defeating Fenwick 20-7, despite the losers being led by Johnny Latner, the future Heisman Trophy winner at Notre Dame. However, the results began to change in 1950 when Mount Carmel, under soon-to-be Notre Dame coach Terry Brennan, won the first of its three consecutive prep bowl titles with a 45-20 romp over Lane Tech of the Public League. From 1960 to 1975, the Catholic schools dominated by winning 16 straight games, and that superiority has largely continued to this day. While the prep bowl is still played each season in Chicago, its presence is no longer front-page news, nor does the contest necessarily match the best teams from the Catholic and Public Leagues. Catholic League schools are now members of the Illinois High School Association, as are the public league entities. And several teams from each league usually qualify for the state playoffs in eight classes of Pret Gridiron Warfare. There's no longer a need to produce a true city championship since the state playoffs take precedence. And much like in the latter days of the Prep Bowl, the Catholic schools from Chicago are now dominating the various classes of the state football playoffs. In 1967, Bill Hyland, the coach of the 1937 Austin Champions, lamented the apparent reasons behind the reversal of fortunes for the Public League. He said, In 1937, I was coaching alone and had the varsity, junior varsity, and freshman teams. In other years, I might have a freshman coach and one varsity assistant. The Catholic schools have as many as 10 or 12 coaches. That gives you more eyes to see things and more voices to correct things. But in 1937, all that the football world could see was the extraordinary gridiron talent of Bill DeCoramont, along with 120,000 of his closest friends. And thank you again for joining this episode of When Football Was Football on the Sports History Network. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hey there, Sports History fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude, 
and I wanted to thank you for stopping by to listen to another episode here on the Sports History Network. Our podcasters are passionate about uncovering and sharing sports stories from yesteryear. And if you didn't know it already, we have over 30 shows across the network covering all sorts of sports history topics. In fact, here's a glimpse into one of our awesome podcasts here on the network. Do you wish you knew more about the 100 seasons of the NFL? You're in luck because you found the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. From the founding of the league in an auto showroom, all the way to what it is today, America's favorite sport and a behemoth of an industry. My name is Ernie Chapman. Football is my passion, and I want you to come along with me each week to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board, my DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. How about that? I bet you're super hyped to go listen to that new podcast, right? Well, to learn about this show and all the other podcasts on the network, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Again, that's sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Head over there today to find your next favorite sports history podcast.